evening, everyone. My name is Rosemary Eldridge. I'm the Director and, of Communications and Programs here at the Catholic Information Center. Um, and on behalf of the Catholic Information Center, our Director, Father Charles Trulos, and our wonderful co-sponsor, the Medicus Foundation, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone who is joining us tonight in person and for those of you watching online for tonight's event, Life, Religious Liberty, and the Survival of Catholic Healthcare, featuring our panelists, Dr. Margaret Duane, Grace Marie Turner, Lewis Brown, and our moderator, Catherine Hadro. Catherine Hadro is going to be giving formal introductions of the panelists, but I did want to take a few seconds um, to introduce our magnetic moderator. Catherine Hadro is host and producer of EWTN Pro Life Weekly, which is an international television show dedicated to the life issues from a Catholic perspective. She regularly interviews politicians, church leaders, and cultural figures on life issues ranging from conception to natural death. Catherine anchored EWTN's day-long coverage of the 2018-2019 March for Life, and her writings have appeared in American Magazine, The Washington Examiner, and the Nas National Catholic Register. And with that, please join me in welcoming our friend, Catherine Hadro. Thank you so much, and thank you all for being here tonight for this really important discussion. The title of tonight's event is Life, Religious Liberty, and the Survival of Catholic Healthcare. And that sounds like a broad topic, but tonight we are going to dive in with top experts on healthcare and discuss what, being in Washington, D.C., I imagine there may be a few of you here who do work in healthcare and healthcare policy. And I imagine our level of familiarity when it comes to specific policies and religious liberty threats probably varies across the board. Uh, I believe I have a pretty good working knowledge when it comes to healthcare policy, but I will also admit this topic can be intimidating to wrap your head around and to discuss. And that's why I really see my role tonight as highlighting our experts and their insights so we can have a really great discussion. And let me tell you, we really do have the top experts when it comes to healthcare. So let me introduce them. Um, our first speaker tonight will be Grace Marie Turner. And Grace Marie Turner is the president of the Galen Institute, a public policy research organization that she founded in 1995 to promote an informed debate over freedom market ideas for health reform. She has been instrumental in developing and promoting ideas for reform to transfer power over health care to doctors her influence. Grace Marie Turner testifies regularly before Congress and advises senior government officials, governors, and state legislators on health policy. She was named by Speaker of the House in 2013 to serve as a member of the Long-Term Care Commission. And Grace Marie Turner speaks extensively in the U.S. and abroad, including Harvard University, the London School of Economics, Oxford University, and the Gregorian University at the Vatican, and today here at the Catholic Information Center for us. Thank you for being here. Our next speaker will be Lewis Brown. He is the executive director at CMF Cura, which is part of the Christ Medicus Foundation. CMF Cura is a Catholic health care sharing option. Lewis Brown helped to establish CMF Cura back in 2014 and previously served as director. And then in 2017, received a political appointment to join the US Department of Health and Human Services here in Washington, DC, until returning to CMF Cura earlier this year. Lewis received an undergraduate degree from Michigan State University and a Juris Doctorate from Howard University School of Law in Washington, D.C. He served as Legislative Counsel and then as a liaison to the U.S. House Committee on the Judiciary. Thank you, Lewis, for Thank being you. here. And finally, we are going to be speaking with Dr. Marguerite Duane. She is our medical doctor on the panel tonight. She is a board-certified family physician and the co-founder and executive director of FAPS the Fertility Appreciation Collaborative to Teach the Science, which is a project of the Family Medicine Education Consortium. She also serves as an adjunct associate professor at Georgetown University, where she directs an introductory course on natural methods of family planning. Dr. Duane cares for patients in the DC metropolitan area via modern mobile medicine, which is a direct house calls based practice. Really phenomenal. Dr. Duane is the past president of the St. Giuseppe Muscati Guild of the Catholic Medical Association and the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., and formerly served as the medical director of the Spanish Catholic Center of Catholic Charity. So let's give a welcome to our incredible expert. And the 
way the format will work tonight is I will ask each panelist to share their opening remarks based on their area of expertise. And then we will follow it up with questions before opening up to the audience. So Grace Marie, can you please begin? Thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you all very much for coming. Medicus for organizers. Lewis, Lewis and I work together on larger health reform initiatives and it's nice to be here to talk with you a little bit about them. I think it's important to start as I often do in, when I talk with members of Congress and congressional testimonies and how much there is that we agree on even though health care can seem like such a politically polarizing issue. Everybody should have access to health care. The care should be affordable and the coverage should be affordable. It, we must maintain quality to doctors and patients the ability to be in control of decisions about their care and we must protect the most vulnerable. That's an important goal of the social safety net. But right now the American people are scared. They're frustrated, they're angry over the their health care, the premiums. One a dad told me who lives in French Virginia just south of here he said I just got a notice from my carrier my premiums are four thousand dollars a month he said that's more than my mortgage he said I want to take care of my family but how am I going to be able to do that and people find that networks are so narrow deductibles are so high that even if they pay high premiums they can't really access the care and I think that's opened up a door for people to more seriously consider really radical options like Medicare for All, where they're told that you can see any doctor you want. All the doctor has to do is just send the bill to Washington. You will pay no premiums. You'll have no co-payments. Co You'll have no deductibles. And people say, great, sign me up. Until they find out, oh, well, that means you're going to lose your employer-based coverage. That means Medicare goes away. The state children's health insurance program goes away. The VA program, actually, I think they'll probably preserve some parts of the VA, but, the, but virtually every other plan in the country is subsumed under a government-controlled health care system. And when you look at the list, and this is from Senator Sanders' bill, the list of things that that this would require is that it would require the Secretary of Health and Human Services to determine all benefits that are eligible for people to get uh, through this new Medicare for All plan. It would go into effect in just a couple of years. It would be dramatically, dramatically, um, d dramatic changes to our healthcare system. The Secretary would decide how much doctors and, and hospitals are going to be paid. The Congressional Budget Office has assumed that they're going to all be paid at Medicare rates, maybe even Medicaid rates. And if there is a Democratic presidential candidate who's basically said, I've surveyed the rural hospitals in my district, and they basically say they'd all go out of business if they had only Medicare and Medicaid rates covering, covering the services that they offer. But I think really, and particularly for this audience, we have seen through the Affordable Care Act, which only really affected a relatively small segment of the health, of the health sector, the individual and small group market primarily. We've seen what happens when the government starts to control decisions about what is to the point that, as we all know, the Little Sisters of the Poor had to go to the Supreme Court to protect their conscience rights. Instances in the recently of doctors and patients going to the Office of Civil Rights in the um, Trump administration because they know someone is now there to advocate for them to protect their conscience and to protect their conscience rights. I know we only have a few minutes, so I just want to talk with you a little bit about some of the things that are happening that I think can give us hope. The Trump administration has a number of policy changes that it is making through its regulatory authority. Congress failed in its effort to try to get repeal and replace legislation through, but the Trump administration is really being very creative, and we actually just published a paper this week by my colleague Brian Blaze. It's on our website at the Galen Institute. Galen Institute founded to protect doctors and patients' rights and give people access to the kind of care and coverage they want, but it's called Health progress and it talks about a lot of the opportunities and initiatives from health reimbursement arrangements to affordable to association health plans short-term limited duration plans there are plenty of, um, of places up front here everybody 
the short-term limited duration plans, lots of options, giving states more options to do a better care, a better job actually, of caring for the vulnerable than Obamacare has done. So there are a lot of options out there, but the plan that, that Lewis and I have been working on through the Health Policy Consensus Group, which I facilitate, way over 100 health policy experts from Washington, from around the country, grassroots leaders, to try to talk about the next generation of health reform. So we don't have to have the government involved in making all these decisions about what's covered and what's not, and going to the Supreme Court to protect our conscience rights, to give, to have power flow down not only to states, but ultimately to individuals to be able to make the kind of choices they want and have a plethora of new options and choices. And I'll close um, with talking about some of the principles that are guiding these conversations. I am a volunteer policy advisor to the Catholic Medical Association and have been working closely with Dr. Steve White, who's former president but currently head of their, um, their health policy committee to develop a list of 12 principles to guide health policy. And he's been all over Washington talking with governments about them. I have a few handouts here. Let me give you a couple of highlights. Starts with patient and consumer freedom, that everybody should have access to quality care. And there should be affordable options that respect the of the individual and the choices they make. Protection for the poor and those vulnerable. We have a preferential option for the poor. They must come first. That did not happen in Obamacare. It does not happen in socialized medical, medical schemes. They try to provide to spread benefits as thinly as possible over the largest number of people in the electorate. People who are most vulnerable at the beginning and the end of life are the ones who are most left out. Solidarity. Obviously, the right people should be able to choose options that are consistent with their conscience and moral and religious beliefs. Subsidiarity, to push decisions as far down as possible to individuals and their families. The social safety net is sound, but that involves both private and public sector as well as the wonderful charitable, charitable contributions that the Catholic Church and Catholic medical associations have made throughout, throughout history, really. The centrality of the doctor-patient relationship, protecting future generations, and the dignity of the human person. And this is something that we've talked a lot with Lewis about, about how we must not have a system that's contrary to God's creation of man and woman. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Grace Marie, and really grateful for all your work. Um, thank you thanks, Catherine. Uh, and thanks, Mitch, and, and, uh, and uh, Father Charles, and obviously Father Arnie is always in our hearts and uh, praying for us because I believe he is in heaven um, uh, as a saint at this moment. But uh, it's great to be with you all. As Catherine said, I'd lead the Christ Medicus Foundation. Uh, we're focused on sharing the love of God in healthcare that each human person recognizes that they are made in the image and likeness of God and that they have an amazing eternal inheritance uh, and especially in a world that's so broken uh, we are an instrument of hope and uh, uh, healing and restoration uh, for every uh, individual that, that we can serve uh, we do that in two ways first by building a new Christ-centered healthcare economy which I'll talk about a little bit at the end uh, and secondly by building the movement to defend religious freedom uh, in healthcare. You can find out uh, more about it uh, through going to our website, Christ Medicus, M E D I C U S, ChristMedicus.org. Uh, so I started working in healthcare when I uh, worked with part, part of a law firm in Detroit, uh, representing the city of Detroit and its labor bargaining with police unions. And healthcare was a major issue there. Uh, went on, worked for a state Catholic conference, continued to work on healthcare went to Congress, continued to work on health care, uh, went to Christ Medicus, continued to work on health care, and, and then HHS, and then back to Christ Medicus, right? Uh, and so it's an it's a issue that's near and dear to my heart, uh, partially because I went to Howard University School of Law, uh, the birthplace of the legal civil rights movement, uh, to become a civil rights attorney, and through a number of uh, uh, awakenings, spiritual conversions in my life, understanding that the foundation of the human and civil rights we enjoy in the United States uh, is uh, through the right to life and the right to religious freedom. 
which takes us to why this healthcare debate matters. Uh, it matters because the outcome of the healthcare debate will determine whether uh, we maintain our God-given human and civil rights uh, in the United States, whether those rights survive uh, in America. Uh, the healthcare debate will determine and decide whether patients and consumers have control over their healthcare decisions, as Grace Marie talked about. Uh, this debate will decide whether the chronically ill, the disabled, the elderly uh, maintain their rights, maintain their human dignity in the healthcare system and beyond. Uh, it'll determine whether we protect the rights of the unborn uh, and the right of religious freedom. As we think about many of us here, probably almost all of us here identify as pro-life, uh, uh, pro-life and healthcare have to be thought of together as one. Uh, the healthcare system determines it. It's not just legislative victories here and there. It's that healthcare is the playing field on which these issues uh, are decided. So at risk specifically, at risk, whether we're gonna have federal funding of abortion and healthcare throughout the system, whether we're gonna maintain some level of religious freedom uh, in healthcare, uh, and whether we have the survival of the Hyde Amendment and other legal protections that currently do an okay job, a patchwork of laws uh, that protect religious freedom in healthcare. That takes us to Medicare for All uh, that Grace Marie talked about, we're, you know, this is great viewing for people at home because you can watch this and then watch the democratic debates and compare, but <laughs> if you really want to do that. Uh, but Medicare for all, it's a legislative proposal getting a popularity. Uh, and, and what is that? So when I talk about Medicare for all, it has a couple iterations, whether it's a public option that I think folks see that, that pro proponents of, of, of a public option see it as eventually becoming a single payer system, or it's called single payer or Medicare for all, it's government controlled healthcare where the government's the center. Uh, it's sponsor, sponsored by Senator Sanders, Senators Booker, Senators Warren, uh, and Harris, all are co-sponsors of that legislation. 100 members of Congress, over 100 members of Congress support it. It would be a socialist takeover, a socialist takeover over nearly one eighth of the US economy, okay? Uh, it leads to a patient loss of their freedom in their healthcare because instead of putting the patient in the driver's seat, Government is the one that's in the driver's seat. Government's the one that's controlling the major decisions uh, about our healthcare system as opposed to a person and their family and their doctor. Most Americans would lose, lose their private health insurance, be forced into a government program. Uh, it would implement a mandate across the board, wholesale. Uh, practices that are pro-life, OBGYN practices would not survive. Authentic Catholic healthcare in the United States would not survive the government takeover of healthcare just wouldn't because they would be forced to do abortions, they'd be forced to do transgender surgery, there would be no protection. This is what we face. This isn't three years from now, 10 years from now. These aren't scare tactics. This is the reality. This is where we're at. So what are we doing about it at Christ Medicus in concert with other great partners like Grace Marie, Dr. Duane, Catholic Medical Association? Uh, what we're doing about this is a couple things. The first thing is we're building that new Catholic healthcare economy. It's important to have a movement, but we have to show it. We have to illustrate it. We have to go out and do it. Uh, and so by the grace of God, uh, we are working with Catholic medical facilities to help them launch, grow, and expand. Or we also have an amazing healthcare sharing option. Healthcare sharing is becoming increasingly popular. Our CMF health sharing option is facilitating, providing uh, healthcare uh, for uh, thousands of Americans across the country in over uh, 45 states, which is great. We're also working with Napa Legal Institute and other organizations. Uh, Josh Holden Reed is here with us from the Legal Institute to advise Catholic employers on good uh, uh, Catholic healthcare options consistent with the culture of life and also better their bottom line. Uh, we're also, as we talked about, building this movement for religious freedom, uh, the grassroots for religious freedom and healthcare so important uh, and really educating Catholics across the country, hoping to be somewhat of a Paul Revere saying, hey, we need to be taking uh, a, a look at this debate. We need to be engaged in this debate. The last thing is we're engaging in public policy and helping to educate uh, the White House, Congress, uh, the bishops, uh, the diocese about what's going on in healthcare, even Catholic hospitals, what's going on in healthcare, what can we do about it? And what does the church have to say? This isn't just about being opposed to something. It's about understanding more deeply what the church has to say, what, what the Lord has told us through the gospel about the dignity of the human person and how to be an instrument of that identity, of that healing that every person needs. So thank you for being with us and uh, glad you're all here. Thank you, Liz. That's thank beautiful. You. Dr. Thank The day was Friday, November 2nd, 1979. It was a crisp fall afternoon. The sun was shining bright. 
At four o'clock in the afternoon, the doctor arrived at the patient's home. He found the woman in the guest room, surrounded by friends and family members who cared for her deeply. He could hear her crying out in pain. He assessed the situation, reassured her that she was making good progress as she prepared to give birth to her youngest child. And to take her mind off of the discomfort in between the contractions, he did a little tap dance to the amusement not only of the patient, but of her family standing beside her. On that day, I witnessed the birth of my baby sister. It was that day that I recognized the beauty and the seriousness of the doctor-patient relationship. In being with patients at their times of greatest suffering and utmost joy, being there not only to lend medical care, but humor and comfort, to be there to support them, to allow the patients to be surrounded by their families and their loved ones in the place that was most comfortable. 23 years later, on that same day, November 2nd, 2002, it wasn't a crisp fall day, it was a hot, hot summer day on the island of Kos in the Greek Isles. Once again, I stood there at the Temple of Aesculapius, where with many of my medical colleagues, I took the original Hippocratic Oath, both in Greek and in English. I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, but I wanna highlight some of the key points because this is an oath that we as physicians, as professionals are called to take, at least sometimes. Unfortunately, medical schools most days don't require physicians to take this oath. But there before my God and before my colleagues, I took an oath saying that I would fulfill according to my ability and judgment, this oath and this covenant. I recited the words, I will apply dietetic measures to the benefit of the sick, according to my ability and my judgment. I will keep them from harm and injustice. I will neither give a deadly drug to anybody if they asked for it, nor will I make a suggestion to that effect. Similarly, I will not give a woman an abortive remedy in purity and holiness, I will guard my life and my art. The practice of is both art and science. It relies on the professional. A professional is one who has to use their wisdom, their judgment based on their experience, considering the individual before them, the human being at their door, and oftentimes, a very vulnerable state. For those of you who have ever experienced sickness or suffering, it's a very vulnerable time. To me, the doctor-patient relationship is the most intimate professional relationship that a person can have with another individual. My patients trust me with their lives, with their health, with their well-being, not only of themselves, but of their family members. So next Friday, on September 20th, 2019, I will journey to the home of one of my patients to see her, the mother, expecting her sixth child in just a few months, to do the well child checks for her children, discuss and engage in shared decision-making about the needs, the vaccines, the recommendations that she should consider I will not simply do what I'm told to do because the government has dictated that this is what I need to do for an insurance company or a government to pay me to care for my patients. As a direct primary care physician, I work directly for my patients. I serve the individual before me. Every person, regardless of their walk in life, their position, their wealth, their job, their status, their medical condition is made in the image of God and is, deserves the utmost respect as I care for them, not only medically, but physically, emotionally, spiritually, respecting their dignity as a human person. To do that, I need more than the 10 minutes allotted to me when I worked at a community health center in DC. How do you care for a young woman with a single mother with diabetes and depression and HIV all in another language? Mm -hmm. 
in 10 minutes and really get to the needs that she has to address the suffering that she's experiencing, to answer the questions she has about the health of her own child. Through direct primary care, it allows us to work directly for our patients. I do believe there should be a single payer, and I believe that single payer should be you, the patient. And I believe that the direct primary care movement, which I am a part of, which is started less than 20 years ago, but is actually a return to what healthcare used to be before the last century. I have my little black bag that I take with me when I go to see my patients. They welcome me to their homes. I never know if I'm gonna be greeted by a five-year-old at the door or a German shepherd jumping up to see me. One of my patients once said, you're the Indiana Jones of doctors. You never know what's gonna hit you when you open the door and I'm like, it's true. But what I do know is I will face a patient who has placed their trust in me as their doctor to care for them as a human being. To do that, I must work for my patients. And I would encourage my medical professional colleagues, especially my physician colleagues, to those that are listening, to return to what we are called to, what we swear to when we take the Hippocratic Oath, to respect the dignity of the human to use our skills to care for them by working for the individual. I'm really looking forward to the conversation tonight, and I thank you very much for this opportunity to share. I thank you. Those were incredibly thoughtful remarks from all of our panelists. Thank you. Grace Marie, I want to give you the first question. We saw, I think it was about two weeks ago, the HHS department issue a notice of violation to the University of Vermont Medical Center because there was reportedly a Catholic nurse who was pressured, forced, required to be part of an abortion. Can you speak to us about that case and the issues of concern that you have? It's really a tragic case, one that I think highlights where we are likely to be going with more and more government control over our healthcare system. The nurse had uh, worked for some time for the uh, Vermont health system and was told that, uh, and she had made it very clear that she would not participate in abortions, that, that abortions were provided at this medical institution. And she was told, they were relatively short staffed, she said, well, we need you to care for this patient who just had a miscarriage. They lied to her. It was an elective abortion. She wanted to walk out and they said, if you do, we will fire you. And so she was forced to continue with the abortion. The physician said to her uh, as they were beginning, she said, I don't hate me. Well, she filed suit because she felt this was a, certainly a violation of her convictions and her conscience that she had made it very clear she was going to abide by. And this, the, the case was uh, accepted by the, the Office of Civil Rights, HHS, which believes that conscience protection, that freedom of religion are a fundamental, the first civil, uh, the first protection in the First Amendment. And so they have basically told the, the medical institution that they are in violation. This is a civil rights violation. The hospital is not cooperating. This is very likely to continue to go through the courts. There have been 1,300 similar cases that have been brought to the Office of Civil Rights, so people whose, whose, whose conscience protections are being violated by medical institutions and others, and, and they are fighting for each one of them. The Trump administration really put... Thank you for bringing us up to speed with that case. It's so important for us to continue to monitor that. Lewis, you kind of mentioned the Democratic debates. The next Democratic presidential debate is tonight, right. following this panel. Right. Uh, at the most recent of the last Democratic debate, one that I kept hearing over and over was health care is a human right. Health care is a human right. Can you speak to that? What is the Catholic Church's understanding on that specifically? Right. Um, health care is a, is a human right. Medical care itself uh, is, a, is a human right. It's part of the right to life. There's a great quote uh, in John Paul's II, one of his writings about uh, as much as the right to health, to home, uh, other rights matter these rights are essentially meaningless if the right to life is not defended with maximum determination uh, and so it's an important it's an important part of our human dignity it's something that we have uh, uh, by virtue of the fact that we're made in the image and likeness of God and we're entitled to certain rights uh, because God gave them to us and no person can take them away at the same time though 
doesn't mean that government must then therefore secure those rights. Uh, it is perfectly legitimate uh, for uh, a, a, those rights to be secured through the social safety net. Well, first of all, through the family, right? Through the church, through the community, uh, through uh, a number of local neighborhoods state resources, and at some point through the federal government, that principle of subsidiarity. Uh, but whether it's uh, my food, uh, my education, uh, my housing, uh, those things are secured for the overwhelming majority of Americans through various and different means. Uh, just because it's a right that I have as a human being doesn't mean that the government has to secure it. And so uh, we as Christians believe in a person's right to life and doing uh, everything that we can to secure that from uh, conception to natural death, but there are a number of different means of securing those rights. Can I just make a point? I think that when people talk about health care as a right, if the government enforces it, that means that you have a right to a physician's time to a hospital's investment in their equipment with their, to, to the, in their facilities whether or not you can pay. Well, we have a system where if you are in need and you show up at a hospital through EMTALA, you are guaranteed threat federally to have care. But if is saying, I want to go see this doctor, but I don't want to pay him or her, then can the doctor even keep the practice open? So what we need is a system in which people have the ability to make have the kinds of coverage options that they want, but there is a there's a lack of care that will be available without government dictates that you have the right to somebody else's education and skills and investment in their practice. And I would I would follow up, I would say, I would dare say that um, government and health insurance, the health insurance industry for the last decades has done more to actually potentially decrease access by making healthcare much more expensive than it actually is. For five years, I served as the medical director of the Catholic Charities Health Centers, where we served an exclusively poor, uninsured, mostly um, low-income uh, immigrant population. Healthcare is not expensive. We would charge, we would, we would request a nominal fee from our patients. These are patients that are living day to day. Um, and on average, they were able to contribute 75% towards the cost of their care. Your doctor, as it does for you to have a cell phone. And as an added bonus, you all get my cell phone number. So I'm <laughs> texting here to my patient who said, my son came home with a fever, can I get a note for school tomorrow? Sure. So all of my patients get my cell phone number for literally what it would cost for them to get monthly cable. You know, we think of how expensive because costs have been, have been um, uh, bloated and also um, misrepresented. So for example, for me to get a cholesterol test on a patient, this is a simple blood test. It costs my patients $5. If you were to get a cholesterol test through your insurance, you might see a bill for $95. It doesn't cost $95, but we add in layer after layer after bureaucracy, after person having to have a say as to whether or not that test should be done, it doesn't work. And if I can, I can share a patient story to illustrate this point um, and the importance of the, the, the doctor-patient relationship. A few years back, I had a patient um, whose three-year-old daughter was, was under my care, and the mother was very, very concerned that her daughter might have Lyme disease. They had been visiting uh, the grandparents out on the farm. She said, I think she had a tick bite. Now she's complaining of all these leg pains. She had a fever one day. I think she might have had a rash. I'm not really sure, and I, I, I'm concerned. I mean, uh, Lyme disease is an infectious disease, but if it goes untreated, can potentially have some chronic uh, complications. And so I spent the time doing a thorough history and physical exam. And after the assessment, I made the determination, and I said this to her, I can say with almost 100% certainty that your daughter does not have Lyme disease, based on taking a full history and, and all the information. And she said, well, is there any way you can know 100% certainty. I said, well, not based on my history and physical exam alone. I said, the only way for me to know with absolute certainty would be to do a blood test to check to see if she has developed antibodies, which are the cells that the body makes in response to an infection to determine if she indeed had an infection. And the mother said to me, well, what does that involve? Or how much does that cost? And I logged onto my website and I clicked on the price 
this tab because all of our prices are right there. And I clicked on LabCorp and we have negotiated with LabCorp and Quest and other major labs to get labs at cost or near cost. And I said, it would be $30. And she's like, $30? She's like, for my peace of mind? And I said, well, that, and you have to take your three-year-old to get her blood drawn, so that might be a little bit of a challenge. But yes, $30. She's like, well, can we do that? And I said, yes, we can certainly do this. She's like, well, would you do that if this were your daughter? I'm like, no, because I'm pretty confident in my history and physical exam skills that she doesn't need that. But you need to be comfortable. And she thought about it. She's like, well, I think I would be comfortable if we were able to do that test. And I'm like, okay. I wasn't insulted that she didn't trust my judgment. I had engaged in shared decision making. We were able to have a conversation about this. I ordered the blood test. Not to my surprise, it came back as a negative. And I said to her, and she was like, oh, I'm so relieved. I'm like, I'm glad. I said, can I just point out though, if you had gone to a regular doctor and they had ordered this blood test, you probably would have gotten a bill not for $30, but for $230. And you would have been responsible for the entire amount because the insurance company would have determined that it was not medically indicated and so they would not cover it. Why? Because mom's peace of mind is not an indication for a blood test, right? So she would have, been, she would have dealt with that bill. But we think healthcare is so expensive because it's not the cost of healthcare, it is the charges. It is what insurance companies charge. And people have then felt they need to go through insurance or through the government but if we actually return to a system where patients pay directly, at the very least for their primary care, healthcare overall would cost so much less. So that leads me to my next question. This is really to all of the panel when it comes to direct primary care. Is that the answer? If the church teaches people have a right to medical care, but we as Catholics are opposed to government takeover of that, really what is the alternative then? So that Americans can get affordable care. Yeah, so I think, yeah, yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. So, you know, um, it, it's not, you know, socialism's bad because it, re, it removes God out of the equation and replaces it with the state. And, it, and for those of us that love St. John Paul II, you look at Poland, uh, you know, there's an agreement that everyone should eat, but we're going to force you to eat and we're going to, you know, determine the menu, right? It essentially, uh, completely eradicates uh, the opportunity for me as an individual to love. It, 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 it destroys charity, true charity, which can only be voluntary. So a voluntary group of individuals coming together to love each other, right, which is the icon, uh, the icon of the Trinity, that's, that's a race, that's not allowed. Private charity, the church, the family, the community, we destroy that because we are the state, because we want God out of the equation. That's why it's bad. Now, why, why things like direct primary care and this, con this balance between subsidiarity and solidarity are so important goes back a little bit to the great conversation that I had with you and Matt uh, a couple weeks ago, which is, uh, as illustrated by an amazing person that's part of our team, Michael Vaca, shout out to Michael Vaca. Uh, Michael gave this illustration, uh, essentially. If I'm in Arizona, if I'm in Phoenix, okay, and I'm a taxpayer, and i um, uh, and I'm trying to, and let's say, regardless of whether I'm a taxpayer, I want to take care of Johnny. I, I read about Johnny in the newspaper. And I, I get a fair sense of Johnny, and I want to help him, right? Well, I'm going to send him, and, and Johnny lives in Detroit, Michigan, so I'm going to send Johnny 50 bucks, help him out. I care about Johnny, right? If I am Susie, who also cares about Johnny, I read about Johnny, but I also actually know Johnny because we went to high school together, and Johnny lives five blocks from me, I'm gonna be able to help him out so much more because I'm actually closer to him. And I know maybe his family, and I, maybe I go to his church, and I know the particulars of what he needs in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and I may have the same intention uh, as the uh, person in, down in Phoenix, but I, don't, I can't help him as well as I could uh, because I'm not in Detroit, I don't know the neighborhood, and I don't know John. That's that balance between what we call solidarity where I wanna help you and subsidiarity. When we have those two things balanced, when we take care of a problem closest to the problem, we deal with the problem better. I can love Johnny because I live down the street, because I'm part of his family, so much better because I'm close to him. And that's, that's the beauty of direct primary care because your doctor is so close to you, knows you, understands your needs. It, it's a beautiful way of loving the patient and treating that person in the particular. 
and government and politicians are enormously threatened by that. There was a quote, just a sort of a the sentence wasn't even really highlighted in a book, but Professor Paul Starr from Princeton University wrote a book called The Social Transformation of American Medicine. What a cool surprise. There's a quote in that book that I think really explains what this is all about. He said, politicians since Bismarck have learned that they could use insurance against the cost of sickness as a means of turning benevolence into political power. They do not want the threat of Catholic charities, of Catholic hospitals, of independent direct primary care physicians, of Catholic, um, of all of the many uh, church groups that, that provide um, care to members through physicians' contribution of their time. The, the, the government sees that as competition. That's why we have to, to work so hard to maintain a doctor-patient relationship, to not let government, they already control way over half of our health sector. And this is the tipping point, and I actually think this next election is going to be pivotal because it's so clear. We're either talking about truly returning power and control to individuals and families or a government takeover. And that's really the end, end of conscience protection, freedom and religious freedom. They see it as competition, but they're threatened by it because they can no longer control right. it. They want to be in control. And to answer your question, when I first discovered direct primary care, it wasn't certainly in medical school, I read an article about it. It was about this practice called St. Luke's Family Practice in Modesto, California. And it was one of the early direct primary care practices. And it was a unique model because it had it was it referred to itself as a benefactor model. So uh, about 30% of their patients paid a higher fee, knowing that that, that that higher percentage went to allow low income patients in their community to get the same access to care that they were getting. And so, you know, it took the government out of the equation and it let the doctors care for patients from all walks of life um, to be able to do that. With direct primary care, what makes it, what distinguishes it from concierge medicine, which is what many people may be more familiar is direct primary care is specifically designed to be affordable. I think the average monthly fee, and it may vary depending on age, is 50 to $70 a month. That is not a lot of money. I mean, I spent more than that, probably three times as much on groceries today. You know, it is not a lot of money. And even for the poor, I mean, it is still something that if they plan for and it's about the relationship. It's not this transaction, every time I see you, I have to pay. My patients pay me a monthly fee and they have access to me all, all the time, essentially. Um, but it allows that comfort that there's somebody there that knows me, that I can trust. And whether it's the mom texting me at, at nine o'clock at night because her newborn has a fever and I'm texting her all throughout the night after I've sent her to the ER for the workup to make sure so she knows this is what they're doing, this is why they're doing it, this is the purpose. It's so incredibly valuable. So I think it's so important that we need to, we need to look at this model. I'm gonna ask one more question before we then open it up to the audience. Uh, we talked about how the Sanders Medicare for All plan would include an abortion mandate. So I wanna, I wanna talk about if there is, if there were to be an abortion mandate with no conscience protections, practically what does that mean? for Catholic hospitals and for individual Catholic healthcare workers? What will that mean? First, it means going to court. I mean, that's the, that's the question for the lawyer on the panel. Right, I, yeah, so, right, no, I think that's a great question. So, um, I think a, a lot of the wonderful Catholic OBGYN family medicine practices that we're aware of that do some level of women's health wouldn't be able to exist. They would have to eventually shut down. It might take a couple years, lawsuits, et cetera. Some of it depends on the court. Um, but they would have to shut down. Same thing with Catholic hospitals. There's a provision uh, both in the House and the Senate bill that would, at least in the Senate bill, I'm not sure if I've seen it in the House bill, but definitely in the Senate bill, require hospitals insurance. And we can see some of the previews of this in California um, where they've gone after pregnancy centers and they've gone after uh, health insur insurance plans of Catholic universities and say, you must provide abortion. Uh, these Catholic hospitals wouldn't be able to stay open. They would have to do something. Um, you don't have pro-life 
medical options. There's not an insurance plan that doesn't have abortion coverage. That's the world we're in. This isn't this isn't scare taxes. This isn't five years from now. This is today. You know, someone someone has you know, we have many situations where people have been penalized and persecuted already in the United States. It's only going to get worse. The beauty is though it's not just the negative, it's a yes to something like what Grace Marie's talking about, like the beauty of Catholic healthcare. So it's just not a no, but it's a yes. Catholic healthcare just isn't something consistent with our faith. It's also the best healthcare, but we have to be sure about the threats that we face. And it really matters who's in control of the government, right? Because apparently, um, Roger Severino, who runs the Office of Civil Rights at HHS, said that he asked some of the, some of the former officials at HHS under the Obama administration, how did they handle these complaints about conscience protections like the nurse from Vermont. And he said, oh, well, we didn't get very many of them. Then he said, well, how come I'm getting, and now we have 1,300 just in the first couple of years. And it's because somebody, the people know that somebody is there to fight for them. The doors were closed to their complaints in the past. I mean, what it means from a, from a practical perspective is who are you going to see when you're pregnant and are delivering your baby? Is it a doctor that is truly dedicated to life? What if you have a poor prenatal diagnosis? What if you have a child with a serious illness or injury? Or what if, like, for me personally, I have an older sister who suffered a serious stroke and is now very, very debilitated. I want to know that there are doctors that are going to care for them. And what will happen is what happened to me about three years ago when I got a call on my cell phone from one of my medical student mentees who called me in tears as she sat and closed off in the closet of her lab. She had just gotten back from the American Association of Pro-Life ob meeting and her classmates ridiculed and mocked her and said, you can't go into a if you're not gonna prescribe birth control and do abortions. Mm -hmm. And she's like, Dr. Dwayne, can I do this? And I'm like, yes, you absolutely can. But if we do not provide that protection, these people are gonna go into radiology or dermatology or pathology. All but who is going to be there day in to day out to take care of you, to take care of your family, to care for you during your pregnancy, to care for you in your disability and your old age? We need to protect conscience rights so we can have physicians that truly adhere and practice in accordance with the Hippocratic Oath. Thank you, that's so clarifying. At this point, we're gonna open it up to the audience. If you have a question, Rosemary has a microphone, so she'll bring it to you. Um, let's see, I see Tom has a question. Thanks very much. Uh, that was really a great conversation. Um, so it sounds to me like the future of American healthcare is uh, sort of similar to higher education in some respects. 80% sort of uh, a government promoted, government financed disaster to some degree in terms of outcome and in terms of, of debt and in terms of cost and then like narrow areas of, of goodness. Um, so I think of like direct primary care to me sounds a lot like the compromise we've made to enable homeschooling <laughs> without kind of broadly dealing with the systemic problems of, of public education or the financing model for higher education. Is that a fair analogy? Is this like the homeschooling, we want this protection? No, no. So no. We, we live in the public policy space and we are not giving up. No, right, and this we, isn't over, that's why we're doing this. We have a proposal called the Healthcare Choices Proposal. We have a website called healthcarechoices2020.org. Many members of Congress are very interested in this proposal. We could talk about the details, but I don't want to take up all of the time here. But it basically does exactly what we've been talking about, about devolving power to individuals and families. The, the, the information age enables so many solutions to people's healthcare problems. And the healthcare can be so much more affordable. So much information is available by the devices we wear on our wrists, with our, through our telephones, taking a picture of a rash. There's so much that can be done. At some point, people are going to be in to demand that and understand what's possible. We need a financing structure that allows them to have that power. I love that quote. We need a single payer system, the single payer is you. But there does need to be an insurance system to protect you against those major medical bills 
that you really could not otherwise right. afford. And that's really one of the things that Lewis is working on, is how can you make sure people have access to their, their physician they need 24-7, mm -hmm. but also have protection if they do wind up with a cancer diagnosis or a car accident or some, dis some serious medical problem that requires $100,000, $200,000 worth of coverage, that's when you need insurance, but that's returning insurance to what it's meant right. to be, Absolutely. not first dollar care. Right, exactly. Right, and, and just to, to engage you all, the, the part of what I want to do this, I'm, I don't agree with hardly anything that Michael Bennett from Senator of Colorado uh, believes in, but he was honest about what is causing work, right? Because this fight's not just about protection of the unborn religious freedom, it's also about the denial of care to the poor, to this. We're, our, all, all three of us hope to have a world in which we have a strong, robust social safety net. Government does have a place. Um, and so we provide that, that safety net, that protection. But for most Americans that can afford to pay on their own, can, can finance that themselves through their employer or through other means, look at health savings accounts. Look at uh, direct primary care. Look at uh, the single, uh, uh, the single, the individual insurance market. Look at other ways of paying for your health care. But let's put them in the center. Let's put them in the driver's seat. The next two years will determine whether the person, the human person, and the patient with God is in the driver's seat, and whether they're the ones that have control. They're, they're the ones that make the decision, or whether the government does. I laughed when you talked about comparing it to homeschooling since I just decided to start homeschooling my oldest daughter <laughs> two weeks ago. Um, but it's going well so far. But um, I, I think the difference is, is physicians, I mean, we hear about this all the time. There is such a problem with burnout among the medical community. Doctors are tired of being told what to do. I mean, you spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of late nights and a lot of all nights learning how to be a doctor to then be told to order this drug or get this test, not by another doctor, but by some administrator at some company that has, you know, maybe has a college education. So physicians are burning out and they're looking for a better way. And interestingly, in the direct primary care world, I would say Catholics are probably in the minority. You've got physicians that simply want to go back to being doctors. And so I think for that reason, the movement will grow because I think this is part of the solution to address the burnout crisis because doctors are medical professionals. We are not providers. If there is one term that makes me more irate is the term provider. <laughs> a provider is a very different person than a professional who uses their experience and uh, wisdom and judgment to make a call versus somebody who says, well, this list says do this, this, this. Completely different world. And I ask you, do you want a medical professional, a physician, to care for you, or do you want somebody that is following a recipe book that the government has written to dis to determine the care that you're going to and receive? To to Lewis's point about um, about freedom, and and the number of physicians there who are really enthusiastic. This is the only group of happy physicians <laughs> I've seen in 20 years. <laughs> they are <laughs> so jazzed about becoming DPC physicians, so that they can begin to practice their profession. But they thought it would be fine for Medicare for All to pass, and then they just do their DPC practice within that because it's apart from government. No, because anything that would be covered by HHS and Bernie Sanders cannot be provided privately. Right. You cannot pay for that privately. That is a violation of the law. So they need, part of this is public education. We need to have people understand yep. that you're not gonna be able to have freedom within the context of this overall umbrella. And also Lewis said that people are talking about, well, let's just let people buy into Medicare or let's just have a public option, which is like a government insurance plan. Can't compete with a government That's that has right. unlimited Gosh. access to taxpayer dollars and can write the rules that everybody else has to pay for. We would quickly devolve to a single payer system That's with right. what they're saying are small baby sets. No, it's the ball game. I'm just going to end with one final question for our panelists right now. Uh, as we wrap up our conversation, what's the takeaway here? What do you want our attendees here and those who are watching via live stream? What do you want them to walk away with at the end of this conversation? Call you two <laughs> and <laughs> sign up. Because the more people that are participating in sharing ministries,
primary care, the more, the stronger that movement becomes, the more people begin to exercise and understand their freedom. And then visit the Galen Institute website so you can see more about the kinds of work we're doing on the public policy front to get government out of the way. Right, uh, echo what Grace Marie said. Uh, you know, uh, I, first of all, we want folks to be aware of the Galen Institute, the amazing work they're doing. When people say there's no alternative health care plan, yes, there is, and Grace Marie is engineering much of it uh, across the country. So that's, that's number one. Number two, uh, go to the Christ Medicus uh, uh, website, Christmedicus, M-E-D-I-C-U-S dot org. Uh, we're building a movement. Uh, to empower folks like the amazing work that Dr. Margaret Duane does, but also to empower a coalition of organizations uh, that understand this in a sober reality that are seeking uh, to protect the human person, protect human and civil rights, and a free healthcare system. So go to ChristMedicus.org uh, and stay educated, stay engaged, talk to, talk to your family members, other individuals in your community, in your sphere uh, about it, uh, and also want to Napa Legal Institute, and if you're a Catholic nonprofit, uh, that's a great place to be. But we have to be engaged. We can't sit on the sidelines. This is going to go quickly, and and now's the time to be engaged. Yeah, I would I would absolutely echo what Louis said. It's important to stay engaged and stay activated, um, and to support the students and the residents, and physicians that are out there trying to um, learn and practice in accordance with their conscience. My my other job outside of being a direct primary care doctor is running. Uh, a nonprofit educational organization called FACTS, the Fertility Appreciation Collaborative to Teach the Science. And we work to educate the next generation of medical professionals about the science of fertility awareness based methods and their role in healthcare um, for women and for couples. And we do this by working with students um, and residents and healthcare professionals across the country. So students and residents oftentimes feel very isolated, very alone, um, very um, unsupported. So. Uh, it's important if you know students in your world, you know, get them connected to, to organizations um, like ours, like the American Association of Pro-Life ob and and um, other organizations that are going to help to support them and encourage them to be physicians that practice the life-affirming care that you would want for yourself and for your family. Because if you're not out there supporting them and staying engaged, what will be left when all if all of these physicians are forced out? of the healthcare field what will be left for you, for your care, for your family. Um, I just want to thank my man, James Wilson, part of our Christ Medicus team. I was going to recognize him, but appreciate all your Sorry, work here. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, per, point of personal privilege. Thank you. And Liz, I know you had some closing remarks you'd like to share as well right now. Yeah, just thank you and get engaged now. We wait on two years on this, oh, I can wait three years on this, especially if you're involved in an organization that even tangentially touches this it will be over. I, part of this for me started at HHS when I saw all of these cases, especially the end of life cases where people are being denied care right now, euthanasia happening right now. We know of all the stories on religious persecution uh, for people of faith in the healthcare system. Uh, if Medicare for all, the public option happens, the wholesale takeover of the culture of death in healthcare, period. And, and so the beauty is, is it's not over. We can do a lot. But we just have to have a sober reality. It is your problem. It is my problem, too. So thank you very much and, and appreciate uh, that, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. And I know we just clapped, but one more round of applause for our wonderful <laughs> panel. Thank you again so much for coming out to this event. Thank you, panelists, for that insightful and engaging conversation and kind of painting that like what you're just talking about, that realistic picture of what we face in healthcare today and for the call of action that you gave our audience of staying educated on this topic, visiting their websites, knowing what healthcare plans are out there for you to use, um, and talking with your friends about it. Grassroots, just talking to your friends, letting them know the options that there are, and uh, you know, doing the best that you can to try and shape a culture um, within our you know, larger like economics and the the greater, greater picture, but also within healthcare. Um, our next event is a book launch event with Charlie Camosi on his new book, Resisting Throwaway Culture, How a Consistent Life Ethic Can Unite a Fractured People. This event is gonna be next, next Wednesday, September 18th at 6 p.m. Um, the event's gonna center on issues ranging from the hookup culture, reproductive technology, 
technology, abortion, euthanasia, property, immigration, treatment of animals, and mass incarceration, so everything. Um, <laughs> so uh, Charlie's going to articulate a new moral vision in which a culture of encounter and hospitality replaces a consumer culture in which the most vulnerable get used and discarded as much as trash and will offer guests an opportunity to dialogue about what kinds of values and serve, uh, that should serve as the foundation for a new political culture. So it's going to be a wonderful book launch event, and we hope you can come. And finally, to stay up to date on all of our upcoming events, join our listserv, follow us on social media, follow us on our website. Um, and thank you again so much for coming out, and enjoy the reception that will go until April. And I have copies of the Catholic Medical Association's principles down here on this. Uh, on <laughs> and this I do year. know that there, we, did, we weren't able to get to a lot of audience questions because we had such great content from our panelists, but they will be available or talk to too answer long. your questions <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the reception. So please approach them if you have a question that you'd like. Thank you. 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 Thank